Just think of it as the rough draft of the podcast world. This is the Newbie Writers Podcast with your hosts, Damian Boat and Catherine Bramcamp. Good morning. It's episode 145 of the Newbie Writers Podcast. And I, I don't know where Catherine is. Uh, apparently, she had some event to go to in Los Angeles hanging out with B-grade actors. So if you see her on TMZ in the next week, then let me know. Uh, so this week it's just me, and I have a very special guest. I love having Australians on because we don't have enough of them. I've got Valerie Koo on. Good morning, Valerie. Good morning. How are you, Damien? I'm doing good. Now, you are the co-host or the head honcho of uh, So You Want to Be a Writer podcast, and oh, your list is unbelievable. We are talking about this in pre-show probably take the whole show just to rattle off what you do, but, we'll get... <laughs> but you're also the founder of the Writers' Centre, or the Australian Writers' Centre. You know, That's right. Yeah? Which I'm very keen to talk about as well. But firstly, why a podcast? Why do we do So You Want to Be a Writer? Oh, mm. goodness me. Well, my co-host, Alison Tate, who is also an author, mm. and I just love talking about <laughs> writing, and we just do it naturally anyway when we catch up, and we kind of figured, you know what, let's let's be a bit more productive here. Let's leverage this a bit. <laughs> Why don't we do a podcast? Because we also do get a lot of questions, you know, via email or social media on various aspects of writing, yeah. so we thought this would be a great way just to communicate with our community and also have a bit of fun at the same time because we certainly do have fun when we record our podcast. Well, yeah, and that shines through. I like your show. I picked it up just off Google. Uh, and But how did you go about getting into that? Because I get questions all the time from people saying, I'd love to do a podcast. How, what's involved? Did you find it like a bit of a tricky process? Because it's still a little bit finicky with things. Sure. Well, I've actually been podcasting for years. So before So You Want to Be a Writer, which started mm -hmm. in two th early 2014, we actually ran an Australian Writers' Centre podcast, which was very different in nature. It, uh, you know, it, it had a very different tone and it had a different structure. And we've been running that for years, ever since... Goodness me, I, you know, years. Mm. I can't even remember when it first started. Um, so when we first started, it was actually when podcasting was still in its infancy. Mm. And, um, you know, so we researched it back then on how to do it. And, you know, I listened to podcasts religiously to understand the different ways and what worked and what didn't. Mm. And so now it's actually a bit like breathing. Um, it, it's, it's not hard for me at all these days because we've been doing it for so long. So I honestly actually can't remember when, <laughs> what it was like when we first started. So it was, did Alison do podcasts pr uh, previously as well? Uh, her and I had a short podcast on social media um, a couple of years ago that we did just for fun. Mm. Um, so, she, so she did do that with me, but prior to that, she hadn't done podcasting. However, I knew that she would be a natural at it because she's got this great voice, mm. and she's you know she she's really forthcoming with information. She really knows how to um, you know to to run the conversation and have a chat, and I think that comes from the fact that a million years ago, specifically maybe 15 years ago, we, yeah. we used to sit next to each other at the offices of Cleo magazine. Ah. So we were desk buddies. So she used to sit literally one or two metres away from me, right next to me, and she... she um, uh, used to be at Clio, as did I. We were both journalists there. And uh, if you can imagine what life in the Clio office was like. Mm, uh, lots, was of, quite... lots of makeup and lollies. <laughs> Well, yeah, oh. makeup, 50 most eligible bachelors, all that sort of thing. So, you know, we, we had a rapport from way back, so I knew that that was um, going to be really useful in a podcast as well. Well, I think that's the key, having that rapport. Like, I know with Catherine and I, we chatted a fair bit before we did, the, like, the official first one, which mm. was still rubbish. The first one's always terrible <laughs> until you get the practice. But, yeah, I think it, it makes the podcast a bit strange if you're getting to know that person while you're trying to give information out to others. Mm, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because people like to be able to relate. They like to hear that it's not that you're relaxed in what you're doing, I think. 
That's right, and Alison has no qualms about paying out on me and, and vice versa. So I think that uh, we we have a, a good thing going in that um, we, we really say what we think. Well, <laughs> I picked that up. I listened to the most recent episode yesterday, and I think I think you said to her, oh, well, I knew sounding very radio this morning. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, the claws are out early. <laughs> And I do it to Catherine as well. I always give her crap, usually about her lack of social media. Uh, oh no! Yeah, her two her two followers, myself and well, probably her <laughs> husband, but that's all right. <laughs> anyway, um, talk to me about the Australian Writers Centre because that yeah. well, I was reading a little bit about it, how you sort of started it off, and now it's massive now, isn't it? It is. It's a uh, it's pretty uh, exciting place to be. So basically, the Australian Writers' Centre was founded nine years ago. Mm. And um, at that time, we were only in Sydney, but now we've got campuses in Melbourne and Perth. Mm. And we have a huge online learning centre because there's, you know, we can't open a centre in every city in Australia. So there's a lot of students who live in remote or rural areas or who just, you know, can't get away. Yeah. you know, because they've got young children or whatever. So they uh, they they work with us online through our online learning courses. And um, and it's great because as you as you've discovered, I really love talking about <laughs> writing. Mm -hmm. And so it's fantastic to build this community of writers, many of whom, and this is the most exciting part for me, mm -hmm. many of whom get published or they change careers, you know, they used to be something else and they've, they've now become full-time writers. And, uh, you know, I love the fact that the courses at the Australian Writers' Centre and the resources and community at the centre have helped people to do that. So, you know, we started off very small. We start, I remember the, f the first class had six people. <laughs> I remember all six of them way back nine, year, no, uh, nine years ago. And now we've had over 19,000 students, um, you know, go through our doors and, and um, it's through a whole variety of courses. We actually started off with two courses and now we've got Oh, geez, over 40 courses or, or so, um, ranging from, you know, creative writing to very genres like thriller and fantasy and popular women's fiction. But also, it's not just about, <clears throat> you know, fictional writing. It's also mm. we have business writing and how to write for magazines and um, all of that sort of thing. So, it's it's there's always something happening, Damien. Oh, well, that's good. I would think about 19,000 people. If you were to pull them all together, you could feel like a small football. Ball oval. Um, I've never thought of it like that, but you're right. Yeah, we yeah. could probably go to the Sydney Football Stadium and fill it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that isn't that a daunting task if you were to stand up there and say, "Thank you, everyone." <laughs> um, yeah, but okay. Let's wind that back. How does that come about? Were you sitting around one day and you thought, "Okay, look, I'm a bit tired of hanging out with most eligible bachelors and reviewing, <laughs> um, yeah, makeup." and why the pimple cream that I've been sent doesn't really work. <laughs> I'm going to start a writer's centre to, you know, help those people out there. And, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you even set something up like that? Do you approach somewhere and say, look, I'd like to rent out a small office space and have people come here and I teach them how to write? How does it work? Yeah, fair enough. A good question. So I actually, it all comes back to the fact that I actually began my career as an accountant. Mm. Now, I know. So at university, I did economics and accounting. I majored in economics and accounting and I became an accountant and I worked for, you know, one of the chartered accounting firms. And the thing is that um, it was a really bizarre career choice for me, especially since I loved writing ever since I was little. Mm. I read books all the time. I often wrote, you know, I, I read the kind of writers I wanted to, that, that I really enjoyed. And um, even at school, I won the English competition. That's, you know, it was a writing competition. Yeah. Five out of my six years of high school. Oh. And yet I did not become a writer. You went into like maths and numbers. What Ridiculous. is wrong with you? <laughs> because I didn't think it was, at the time, I was wrong, but at the mm. time, I just, it wasn't even in my frame of reference to think that this was possible or to think that this was a real career. I just thought that, that writing is, I don't know, what other people did, <laughs> other people who were not me. And um, I had this really, I had this misconception that, um, 
you had to be an artist starving in a garret and you had to be poor and I didn't want to be poor. <laughs> I've since discovered that I was wrong in what I thought. Hmm. Um, but uh, I, so I went into the world of accounting just thinking, you know, I, I want a good stable career. Or I just didn't even really think of writing at all. And um, I went into the world of accounting and um, I discovered that even though it was a fantastic valuable skill to have and I still have it, which is great, mm. but it, was, it wasn't the right career for me. It's certainly the right career for some people, but it wasn't the right career for me. So I was getting to the stage where every Sunday night I would actually feel ill, like physically ill because mm. at the thought of going to work the next day because I didn't enjoy my, you know, career. Mm. And I realized I had to do something about it and eventually, you know, I did. And I moved into public relations initially because I still didn't think writing was a real career. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, um, uh, but it was a little bit more creative and um, I thought that that, you know, I still had one foot in corporate in a sense mm. and eventually I, I made the leap, um, you know, to a writing career. But during that time, I had done so many different writing courses because, you know, I wanted to educate mm. myself and learn about the craft of writing and learn, like, just get to know people who love the same thing as I did. So I did so many different writing courses at so many different providers mm. and they had they were they varied with so many different levels of quality yes and you know some were absolutely fantastic and some were just so woeful it was horrendous there was mm. no you know standard or consistency so what I wanted to do because I knew so many other people who were you know, had potentially chosen the wrong career for them initially but were interested in writing mm. and they were experiencing similar things. But, you know, fast forward 15 years or whatever mm. after I'd actually become a writer, you know, been an experienced journalist for many, many years and all of that sort of thing, you know, I had a whole wealth of experience under my belt. I realised that I wanted to create the kind of centre that I wished had existed, you know, 15 uh, yeah. or so years ago. And I wanted a centre where it, look, it was going to be consistent quality because mm. because I had that background in corporate, I think I wanted a centre that would be really professional, that wasn't just a, you know, a, a, a held in a church hall or something. <laughs> yeah. um, and I wanted else. really quality teachers and I really, and I wanted um, to make sure that regardless of whether you did the course in thriller writing or in popular women's fiction or in business writing, you were going to get an incredible, the same level of quality, really good quality. Yeah. And um, so that's how it started because I wanted to, I had this vision for this dynamic, you know, writer's centre, which initially I thought was just going to be one centre, but now is several. <laughs> um, and uh, that's how it began, really. You know, with those courses that you undertook, I know that like, my mum is always up for doing courses and she wants, she's done a few creative writing courses. Mm. And one of them was, uh, she rang me going, this is just disgusting. It was at someone's house, mm. first mistake. And then, <laughs> yeah, they all just sat around out the back, uh, you know, under the veranda and everyone would have to write in silence and then you'd have to stand up and read it out and that was a creative writing course. Oh, dear. And I, that sounds like someone's having a rort to get their centre link, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How do you then overcome... Just being part of the pool of, oh, yeah, we offer writing courses. How do you become sort of really recognised as this is the Australian Writer Centre is the place to go and that if I have that certificate under my belt that other places will go, oh, wow, okay, yeah, we can accept that. Mm. Um, it's when you first start, you don't have that mm. <laughs> because no one knows, you know, about the quality of your courses or anything. So it takes time to get to that stage. And really, you're judged by the quality of your courses and the service you provide and the outcomes that the student achieves. So that's going to take time. It's, it's not going to happen in your first few months or anything like that. Yeah. But once people start coming to the course and, it's, and experiencing it and telling their friends, but they then importantly, getting published or whatever their particular writing goal is because not everyone wants to get published. They might have other reasons for doing it. And, you know, once once that actually starts happening and people, basically it's been word of mouth, mm. you know, it's basically been people telling other people about their experience and that's how that reputation has happened. Well, how do you recruit then 
like lecturers early on. Do you say to them, yeah. look, I've got this, I've got this centre, and um, <laughs> would you be interested in teaching, you know, a couple of courses? I'll, I'll give you a slab of beer. Like, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so uh, it, it's very easy these days. In fact, we have people come. I have I get emails and inquiries every single day from yeah. people who want to teach with us, and we say no ninety percent of the time because you know we 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 have a certain criteria. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the early days, that's a really good question because mm. in the early days, no one knew us from a bar of soap, but. Mm. I made sure that whoever I approached, and I only wanted to approach quality people with incredible experience in teaching and their area of expertise of writing. Um, but I, uh, I made sure that no matter who I approached, um, I did it in a really professional way. I made sure that they were going to be paid in a professional way. Mm. To this day, I think we're one of the most efficient payers of invoices <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> um, uh, we, you know, and so I wanted to give them a certain level of comfort and professionalism, so that they knew they were dealing with um, somebody who <clears throat> it wasn't treating this as an exercise in the back room of their house. Yeah. Well, so do you put at the bottom of your invoice? Trust me. I used to be an accountant. What? A <laughs> no, I don't. Maybe I should add that. I, <laughs> I think they've discovered that when their invoices, uh, we honestly, for some of our, to this day, for some of our new presenters, I mean, the people who've joined us more recently, we will get emails after their first one or two payments mm. um, saying, oh my God, I can't believe how quick you pay. <laughs> I, we we get that. I mean, my wife looks after all that sort of thing because she works in accounts payable for a local government mm -hmm. place. And so when she looks after my business, it's unbelievable. Things are on, you know, always to the letter, to the day. It, it works yeah. out perfectly. And it does. It gives you that real professional outlook. You don't want to have people saying, where's my money or yep. you're overdue on paying this. If you can get that bit right, then the rest just falls into place, I found. That's right. Um, but we did... Actually, I did a job at a, an accounting firm recently, and I've got to say, there's a different vibe in those places. <laughs> uh, yes, there is. It's also a bit strange that, and I've, I've not encountered this before, but there's only like six or seven males in this accounting place, and four of them are called Simon. So that was really strange to walk up to the front <laughs> desk and say, look, I'm here to see Simon, and four people turn around and go, yes? Oh, <laughs> my like, goodness. God. That's funny. Anyway. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, but that must have been scary, though, a little bit. Like, if I, I if I was to think, you know what, I'd like to have a writing career. I've got a house, you know, a child, wife, that sort of thing, car loans. Mm. To go from, and in your case, professional journalist, you were an accountant, so you would even understand sort of the money side of things even more how mm. important it is to then go, okay, I'm going to take that dive. That's, that must have been pretty scary. Uh, it wasn't that scary because I made sure it wasn't a dive. I made sure it wasn't this giant leap. I took baby steps. So even though, you know, going from a career in accounting to becoming a writer is, is totally so different, I, I, I made sure I take baby steps and that is what I encourage our students to do if they're um, considering transitioning careers. So, for example, um, one guy, he is an IT and... Um, so, in, but I said he's got you know mortgage, kids, all that sort of stuff. I said, don't quit your day job straight away. <laughs> mm. So what he's done, he's moved it to four days a week. Okay. And then, so that was a little while ago, but now he's moved it to three days a week. So he's not quite there. So it's still three days a week. He's not quite there to become a full-time writer, but he writes two days a week or, you know, he probably writes more than two days a week, but he only works in his IT job three days a week. So it's it's a staged process. And I encourage people, especially if you've got responsibilities <laughs> and, you know, mortgages and stuff, to do it in a staged process and so you're not letting go of the next step till you you know, raise your income to the same, you know, to a similar level to what you need. You must, you'd have to have a pretty good relationship with where you work or be in a situation to do that. I mean, if you're working nine to five for somewhere and then you go into your boss or your manager and sit down and say, look, I'm just wondering, look, I really want to be a writer. I don't want to <laughs> be here really, let's be honest, but um, can I have one day off a week? 
<laughs> well, if you're going to say it that way, you're going to get a no. <laughs> but if you position it in a different way, <laughs> you're more likely to get a yes. So it's all about positioning, really. Mm. It's all about, it's not about you, it's about selling it to your employer. Oh, how would you sell it? Like in my situation, being an audio visual tech, so I'm, an, you know, we, we have to be out and about installing. How would I sell that to a potential boss to say, I really want to have one day a week off? Well, you've got to pr prove your value. So number one, you don't even ask until you know you're good and your boss perceives you as good. So yeah. you've got to be good in your job in the first place. And then you need to be selling it as you can achieve whatever in that amount of time. Or you're gonna, it's going to save them money as well because, mm. because you, they don't have to pay you for X days, you know, whatever days a week. But it, it, there's no one single answer to that because it depends on what's actually going to be appealing to your employer. Mm. So you need to work out what actually their priority priorities are and how to how to how to cater to those priorities, which is going to be different from you know business to business. Hmm. So yeah, you need to assess each situation um, individually, but make sure that it's not just this is what I want. It's hmm. actually what how it's going to help them. Well, I, I managed to score a day off a week with a company I worked for. I was contracting though, so it was a bit different. And I said to him, and he knew he, I worked with him in the industry before, but a lot of people in my profession as an installer only lasts about three or four years. And right. I said to him when I came to work for him, I said, look, I've been doing this for 10 and my life, my back is wrecked, my body is, it's had enough. I need that mm -hmm. day. I can only do four days and I need a day yeah. off in the middle to recover. And he just went, oh, okay. But then that got perceived as you're just sitting at home <laughs> watching TV. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, like I said, it's all in the positioning. Yeah, it's all right. Little did he know I was setting up my own business anyway. But whatever. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. But how do you? Okay. So how do you come up with courses? Do you do? You, are you constantly reviewing them and saying, look, you know, the the romance genre is very very popular. Unfortun yeah. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> there's definitely yeah. trends. So sometimes there's a lot of, um, you know, people who are interested in a particular topic and if we get a lot of inquiries about that, then obviously that's an alert to us mm. that, you know, we need to fulfil a need because there's there's people asking for it. Um, for example, at the moment, uh, especially with the uh, centenary of Gallipoli coming up next year, there's a lot of interest in um, military history, but just Australian history generally. I mean, as, Austra as Australians, we're very interested in history. Yes. You know, that's just a natural thing for us, it seems. So we've, we've got a course now on writing Australian history so that people know how to write it accurately and they're not just relying on the, you know, their grandfather recounting it or whatever. <laughs> they know where to go to get some facts and they know where to go to, you know, get those little details that can make their story just come alive. Mm. Well, how do you deal with then those people that they come to the, the courses almost with that hope expecting, well, if I go to this course, you guys will get me published? We're really, really stick uh, and we're really straightforward mm. and we're not going to get you published. We're going to give you the tools to help you get published and we, you know, we make sure that people know these are the things that you need to um, be aware of. These are the people you need to start contacting. These We're not going to make the contact for you unless we happen to know there is a perfect fit because ultimately you've got to do that yourself but we certainly provide people with the tools and the direction direction but ultimately you've got to take action yourself because mm. it's your career it's your life so do you have like publishers contacting you and saying yeah, you got anyone absolutely. that's that's you know sort of a standout and you can say yes you know that would make yeah. it wouldn't that Absolutely. make it worse? Absolutely. So many of our students have gone on to be published with Hachette, with Harper Collins, with Pan McMillan. Definitely, yeah. But what about though yeah, I'm just trying to think of, you know, I've been in school and studied further on afterwards and you always get those couple of people that then get really snooty because it's like, oh, that person's excelling. Oh, look, they picked up a publishing thing. Well, how come I can't? You know, I just think, yeah, if you've got publishers approaching you, that's, that's pretty amazing though. So, yeah. You know, it means you're up there, the upper echelon now, you're out, you're out of the backyard and veranda sort of room. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, no backyard. We do have a very nice veranda in Sydney <laughs> that, you know, that is very inspirational actually because it looks onto Wendy Whiteley's garden at Brett Whiteley's w what you know, wife mm -hmm. and um, uh, the Harbour Bridge. So it's it's a creative place to be. Don't knock verandas. <laughs> I don't I don't have one. Um, do you, well, do you feel then the pressure to also keep publishing, to write more books and that sort of thing? Uh, no, I want to write a book when I have something to say, mm. um, not just for the sake of it. I, um, you know, my last book which was out last year, was called Power Stories, the eight stories you must tell to build an epic business. Mm -hmm. And what it does is combines my two passions, storytelling and business. Yep. And so that was a really natural fit for me and I had a lot to say. So um, even though I have a book concept brewing in the back of my head, I don't feel the pressure to to you know to publish it until you know it's kind of like bursting out of me kind of thing because yeah. at the moment the beauty the beauty about the you know technology and the wonderful world of blogging is that you can express a brain fart <laughs> or, or you know a simple concept at any time and I do because I I do blog yeah well that's that's the thing I feel like I feel a little bit of pressure with this show being you know we're, we're there to help newbies get out there and that sort of thing and like the stuff that I work on doesn't really ever seem to get you know too far but at the end of the day I think well hey that's the whole point of this show is that I'm the newbie on here and we normally have Catherine who's the pro and she gets to sort of say well you're an idiot you know backhand me and say get moving with things <laughs> Yeah. Are you expecting me to backhand you and tell you to get moving with oh, you? You're not the first guest, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought, you know, if you're running this sort of Australian writer centre, if there was that added pressure to say, well, look, I'm, you know, we're teaching you how to do it and I'm also the result of that. Here's another book that I've sort of put out there. Um, mm. Yeah. I, I guess I guess the thing is I'm not the only teacher at the Australian Writer Centre. So, you yeah. know, my book was out last year, which isn't that long ago, but we have a whole heap of teachers and they're publishing all the time. Mm. So Pamela Freeman, who teaches creative writing, her book has just been picked up by Hachette, like her 30th book yeah. has been picked up by Hachette. It's called The Soldier's Wife, mm. and like which is a reflection, again, of the interest in Australian history and the war. Mm. Um, Alison Tate, who teaches our magazine writing course, her she's got a – she's just been – commissioned to do a trilogy um, for for you know young adults and that's coming out it's the first one's coming out in October so you know people our, our teach all of our teachers are getting published all the time so um, that's just two of them I mean lots of them are having their books released is, is that a requirement to be a teacher there like to say well you've, you've done that hard yards you you can talk about being published or you can teach them that sort of thing Absolutely. You need to talk the talk and walk the walk. So not yeah. everyone has to have a book because, for example, writing for the web, the teacher for writing for the web just needs a, it needs a lot of web experience, <laughs> writing for the web experience. The yeah. teachers for writing for magazines don't need to have a book published, but they need to have a whole heap of, you know, magazine experience. So, yeah, you need you definitely need to talk the talk and walk the walk. Of course. That would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? If, yes. like if <laughs> Well, it confounds me. Honestly, I, 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 I look at some other providers and I, I saw one the other day and there was um, a, someone who was teaching how to write for magazines and she had one article published. Really? Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So we, I, was, I was gobsmacked. I was, I'm still gobsmacked. Yeah, but they must be really good at promoting themselves then because I... I've seen this as well. In my trade, right, you need to be licensed to do certain things. Mm. And so the government bought in that you need to be licensed to install antenna systems. Fine, whatever. So I went and did my add-on to my normal license. And the guy teaching it, he was giving us all this demonstration. I sort of put my hand up and said, um, we don't do that anymore. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I, I had, because you had to bring tools in. And I and he said to me, what's all that on your desk? I said, this is what you use. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it was strange. I ended up being sort of standing there in front of the class going, this is how we do it now. Oh, wow. So, yeah. It's, that's, it's, it's disheartening if you're um, learning from somebody who, you know, isn't, experienced but what's more heartbreaking for me is if the student doesn't know that yeah 
Yeah, so I, I'm kind of like the um, a bit of a yardstick in that I really make sure that our teachers have a certain standard. They don't get to teach with us unless they, unless they're you know, mm. excellent. Mm. So how do you then keep track of that sort of thing? You know, if you're if they if they're in that that group there as the the teaching staff, mm. do you, are you constantly sort of checking on them or trying to get feedback from the students saying? You know, how did they go? Did you feel that, you know, to sort of push them up a bit? Absolutely. So we um, ask every single student hmm. after they finish their course for feedback and <clears throat> that feedback gets shared without the names of the students. The, yep. That feedback gets shared to the presenter as well. So what's the funniest bit of feedback you've ever had? Mm. Um, this wasn't actually a course at the Australian Writers' Centre. It was a course I taught in-house somewhere mm. and the feedback was, I would like more different types of bread for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, yes, that was the profound feedback <laughs> of the day because <laughs> lunch was provided sandwiches and they wanted more different types of bread. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you ever get... Oh, see, that's, you, you open yourself... <laughs> Right up, don't you? Say, look, we provide you lunch. And then do you get those emails coming, well, I'm gluten intolerant, so I can't have that. Like, oh. We don't provide lunch um, because there's a cafe right next door which students <laughs> go to, and they can ask the cafe for gluten free food. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Come to the Australian Writer Centre, we'll look after your bowels. Yeah, that's not going to work, is it? And in Melbourne, there's four cafes to choose from, so they're right next door. Oh, okay. So they can get their gluten free there, and they've got gluten free there. Is <laughs> that so, well, only four in Melbourne? I've been to Melbourne. There's more than four, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, um, look, I'm at your website. What's this uh, social callout dot com? Oh yeah. There? So that is a um, so I advise some businesses and startups and that is a um, business that I advise and it is a service that connects brands with bloggers because as you know the blogging world has exploded in the last you know mm. three to five years and a lot of bloggers are looking to not just write and express themselves but also potentially to earn a part time income or sometimes a full time income yeah. uh, it, that's a little bit harder to earn a full time income from blogging, but it's certainly possible to earn a, a part-time income and definitely possible to earn pocket money. Yeah. Um, and so some brands want to connect with bloggers who may be appropriate you know, in their niche, who, who may be a good fit for their niche. So yep. they might be a beauty product and they want to con connect with beauty bloggers or they might be, uh, might have a product that's good for young families so they want to talk to parenting bloggers. And that is just a sort of a way to facilitate that connection for them to know what bloggers are out there and these are the bloggers who are interested in hearing from brands and then they can make their own relationship and connection you know, mm. and perhaps do a sponsored post or do a giveaway of the product or trial the product or all that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I find it hard. I mean, I have a business that's obviously not related to, to writing and the biggest thing that I struggle with is that my, I don't necessarily, we don't have any sort of product but we're in competition with other audiovisual companies around mm. and when... You know, I've I've had these chats with people online. They say, you know, we we help promote your social media sort of thing. And like, well, what am I going to put up on social media, really? That just doesn't become blatant. Oh, look, we did we we put a projector in today. <laughs> we, we put four TVs in today. Like, who cares? Um, yeah. And then you there's also that thing about the whole you create a network which again is a bit hard because a, a rival company is not going to put my link on their website or say, check these guys out, are they? Um, so it's quite interesting. That's why I thought I'd sort of ask you about this social A rival product. company might not, but um, I mean, if you do residential, say, then uh, a interior designer would be a good person in your network. Yes, well, I, don't, you know, I don't do domestic. I, I tell you, I did it. We used to. <laughs> wow, that is painful. Uh, there is nothing like being at someone's house at five o'clock while they're trying to cook dinner and yes. they've got the four-year-old going, Mom, why isn't sure. play school <laughs> on? Put play school on. Like, oh, God. Oh, dear. At least I can go home. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, and then you get those phone calls you know, after you've left going, hey, mate, the soccer's on tonight, TV's broken upstairs. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Not my problem. <laughs> So yeah, but with the the whole social networking for business, 
Yes. Do you think we're a little bit flooded with people that offer those services as well? I mean, I constantly have people following me <laughs> on Twitter going, hey, we can improve your Twitter standing. Like, really? I just, whatever. Yeah, I mean, at the moment there are a lot of self-confessed or self-appointed social media experts or yes. social media gurus out there and some are really good and some are really not. Mm. So like anything in life, um, you really got to make sure that you're working with, if you choose to work with these people, you've got to be working with the right people because, um, and, and it, that is hard to, to figure out, especially if you're not, an, not familiar with social media or you don't use social media yourself. Hmm. So um, I'm hoping that in, say, a couple of years or in a year, there'll be a bit of a rationalisation in that industry to make sure that the ones who aren't really are good, you know, stay and stand out from the crowd and hopefully the not-so-good ones <laughs> fall away. <laughs> yeah, I, and even, like, with this, how do you sort of break through all that muck? Like, yeah, what, what set, sort of sets that aside from the other tweet that I get from someone else saying, we can do this for you? What sets the, uh, yeah, the the thing that sets you apart is creating a relationship, um, because there are the people who just broadcast. Hey, I put out a projector today, or hey, I wrote this by my book. Yeah. Um, but then, and and that's fine if you want to do that. That's fine. However, if those people actually connect with other people and are interested in what other people do, then that is where the cut through occurs. I'll, I'll tell you one story. I I there, a couple of years ago, or not that long ago, I was at the time, obsessed with going to the gym. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, it was just the thing at the time. And um, there was this other girl on Twitter. I did not know her from a bar of soap. Yeah. But as it turns out, she was obsessed with going to the gym. So we kind of followed each other just because we were both gym doing junkies. the same thing at the same time. We both engaged the services of a personal trainer around the same time. And that all we did was follow each other. We didn't. We never hung out. We didn't know each other. Mm. And then one day she said, so, but, you know, we would occasionally say, tell each other, good on you for, you know, running 10K or something. It's just motivational. Mm. And then um, one day she was tweeting about the fact that she loved vintage typewriters, antique typewriters. And I, I remembered that. I didn't even reply. But about two weeks later, I happened to be in a shop, one, uh, antique, uh, like a pawn shop, yeah. as in P-A-W-N <laughs> yeah. shop. Um, in somewhere in Sydney and I saw one and I knew it was exactly the kind she was describing. So I tweeted her back and this was weeks later saying, you know, I saw a typewriter in this shop, blah, blah, blah. And obviously she appreciated that because she realised I remembered that she tweeted that. Yeah. And she, you know, that I, it, I wasn't just blasting information about my writing courses to her or about my services. She wasn't blasting any information to me, but we started, we kind of had a connection hmm. and we, we then increased our, you know, uh, conversation on Twitter. And then one day about another couple of weeks later, she had tweeted that she's looking to um, showcase businesses who use social media a lot. And as it turned out, she's the editor of Dynamic Business Magazine. <laughs> Yeah. So I, you know, I tweeted back and I said, oh, yeah, I'll send you an email about it. And I did and I explained how we use social media and, you know, all that sort of stuff, the, the kind of information I thought she might be interested in. Mm. She did find that interesting. She turned that into a, you know, three or four page article in the magazine and it became the cover story. So it was actually my face on the cover of the magazine all about how we use <laughs> social media. And that is because... I created a relationship with her online. I didn't meet. I still hadn't met her at this <laughs> stage, but I was on the cover of her magazine. <laughs> so you know, that's how you cut through. You don't just blast your, um, you don't just blast your products and services or what you had for lunch. You have mm. you create relationships. Yeah, I'm all for that. I always try and talk to people. I don't. I don't like the just look. Here's a link, or they post a quote from their book. But yeah. it, because you can only get 140 odd characters, it's like half a sentence, so it hasn't like makes no sense. Yes. You know, like Kevin sipped his coffee, <laughs> buy such and such book. I'm like what? Um, you because yeah, both you and Alison touched on this. I think on your most recent show about you know with Twitter that a I think was it you or Alison doesn't you don't follow back unless you've had a little bit of a conversation with the person, which I think is quite important. Um, and also that it, you're saying that um, 
there was someone that they wanted to break into something, saying that they're a copy editor or something. Mm -hmm. And you know, how did they get that out there on Twitter? And, yeah. and the response was, "Well, you should probably put that in your bio." Yeah, <laughs> I'm all for that. I'll only follow people back if it has some reference to author, writer, editing, something in sort of what my Twitter handle is about. Yeah, you know, the writers, because. At the end of the day, why would I want to sort of talk to someone that just can offer me 30,000 Twitter followers for $10? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. And they're, 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 they won't be, you know, people who are genuinely interested in you anyway, they'll be bought. Well, yeah. And I, I've i stopped looking at my Twitter feeds now because mm -hmm. it's just too noisy. Mm. You've got like two, 3,000 followers. That's mm. often two, 3,000 tweets of shit, basically. <laughs> you know. How do you rise above that? But I, I don't know about you, but I try and have a little bit of a game with it. So if I see someone post something up like, um, oh, make sure you love everyone. It's like, oh, goodness. You know, that sort of stuff. You get those a lot. Yeah. Make sure you love everyone. Come to my blog. And oh, it's like, dude. well, not today. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel like it today. Yeah, I <laughs> usually send tomorrow. them tweets like that going, can I take a rain check on the love? Or <laughs> And it... I, the the reason I do that is I try and break them out of just that automated thing mm. to have them go, what is this about? And if they do that and at least respond with what, then I know at least they're a real person reading their own tweets. Exactly, yes. You know, I don't know. So how does then that social media thing work for, you know, authors? What What do you reckon is the best thing to do other than, you know, trying to create that sort of conversation thing? How do you promote your book if you've got that? Um, yeah, you've got that piece, that published work, and you don't want to necessarily just be talking to everyone at random and then go, oh, psst, by the way, buy my book. <laughs> it, I think it's important just to um, help people understand that you are an author. So actually, you know, share aspects of your writing process as the book is being written, because it, it also helps people go on that journey with you. And then, and then when the book is finally done, they've actually followed along that journey with you, mm. and and they're almost bought into the process. Um, it's the same as a friend of mine. She opened a restaurant in Sydney, and for eighteen months, all she did was tweet about the process. Oh, I went to see this, you know, um, place in Haberfield or I went to see this, oh, I, you know, I tried to sign the lease here, whatever. Mm. I'm looking for a supplier of meat and the restaurant didn't even exist. Mm. But for 18 months, she was just tweeting about what she was doing to get the restaurant <laughs> up and running. Mm. And by the time she actually did open, it was full house every night and she, and, and, and it continued to be so for about... I think about two years or a year, at which point she just was made an offer she could not refuse because it was such a popular restaurant. She's like retired now. Wow. <laughs> and every single supplier she got for that restaurant she had met on Twitter. Really? Well, there yep. you go. Yep. That's pretty cool. I mean, we see that, they're, you know, you've got to love Adelaide. We're so, so old. Um, that, yeah, we had a news report where a couple of cafes were doing this. And I think they were posting up um, like shots of coffee, like the best design of the day or something. You know, they're oh, just yes. mucking around with it, and that generates enough that now people go there and they want to see if they can get their coffee on Twitter or whatever. Yes, stupid, <laughs> stupid. but people seem to do it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so so we've got a few few little things that we need to move on to, like little segments on here, but. Um, what would be the ultimate tip for an absolute beginner? Mm. So, like, we're sitting around, we're talking, I'm a newbie. What's the number one tip you can give me? But tip for what? What do you want to achieve? I don't know. Well, there you go. See, there's a good question. What do you want to achieve? I'd exactly. like to have a, I'd like to have a published <laughs> book. Let's start with that. Uh, what was that? I'd like to have a published book. That's what okay. most people come to us with and go, I'd like, I've got this book, I'd like to get it published. Sure. Fiction or non-fiction is my next question. Fiction. Okay, so you want a published fiction book, where do you start? Is that the question yeah. or, the, or the ultimate tip? Well, like, yeah. either Well, or. let's do where do you start. Yes. <laughs> if you're a 100% newbie yep. and you want to get a published fiction book, number one, you've got to start writing. So it's, you've got to stop being an intention and stop being out just something that's in your head and you've got to start writing on a regular basis mm. and whether that's daily or every other day, I don't know, you know, you need yeah. to fit it into your lifestyle naturally, but you need to commit um, 
regular time to it. For those people who go, oh yeah, I'm going to wait till I'm on annual leave and I have three weeks. Yeah, right. It doesn't work that way. You need, even if you commit, uh, and Julia Cameron says this in The Artist's Way, even if you commit writing three pages a day, and they're just short pages in your book. And honestly, that can maybe only take you 10 minutes or depending on how quickly you write, if you type really fast, it might only take you seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. or something you might be able to do on the bus or on the train. Even It's one thing that I got one of our first groups to do, just mm. write for three pages a day. And one particular lady was saying to me that um, she didn't, you, you know, she didn't write regularly, but she started just committing to three pages a day. For, and I said, do it six days a week. You get a day off. <laughs> um, Crack and the she whip. said that often she would start writing and three hours later she was still writing. And, mm. you know, because th that's the thing is people often just don't even get started. So number one, commit to a certain regular schedule mm -hmm. of writing that you're going to write even and and if you if you if you can't commit an hour don't just commit writing 3 pages and and make sure you do it so absolutely you've just got to just write <laughs> to to start off with because you've got to get it out of oh I'm going to write a book one day to actually start writing it so without a doubt that but the second thing I would say is once you get start the ball rolling mm. get a bit of momentum going and you know for some people if you don't have that discipline a writing course might be the thing that makes you start writing because it's going to have exercises. It's going to actually tell you what to write. So some people might benefit from doing a writing course because mm. then it's more structured and they kind of have to go. They have to write this assignment or whatever it is. Well, yeah. So so, so a writing course could be useful if you feel that you need the a little bit more structure. Mm. But also once you start your momentum going and if you have never done a writing course in your life, I do encourage you to do one uh, because it teaches you the fundamentals of, of writing. Mm. It teaches you the things that you might do instinctively but you might not be doing it quite the right way. And yes, you need to be free-flowing on all of that with your writing but it's so true that you need to know the rules in order to know when you can break them. Yeah. And I was reading a, 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 a novel yeah. um, that had been self-published by a guy. Uh, it was a fantasy. And I you know, got about 30 pages in and I could tell this guy is a great storyteller. And you know, I could tell this story is going to go somewhere. And I said to him, you haven't done a writing course, have you? And he said, no. Mm. Really, I've already written a novel. Why would I need a writing course? And I didn't expand on that at the time because it wasn't appropriate at the time. But <laughs> the thing is, he he desperately needed one because he was such a great storyteller, but he made so many little, little mistakes mm. in the way he wrote his dialogue or in, you know, just just little little things like that which could have been so easily covered off in an introductory writing course because what happened then it was very jarring for the reader so even though there was this great story about to be told mm. it was it was really kind of annoying for the reader to, to read it and, and a lot of people would not have persisted because they don't want to be annoyed. Mm. Was well, that something that could be picked up during like if you had it edited? Like if you sent it to an editor? Well, that's the trouble is that you need to send it to the right editor. He hadn't sent it to the right editor. He sent it to a proofreader, uh, which is very different. Yeah. The proofreader doesn't comment on your structure or the way you express your sentences. They proofread your typos and your, you know, punctuation and stuff. It's very different. So you need to be sending it to the right editor. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's the beauty about this show for me is I've got to know editors over the years and I can send them little bits and pieces. Um, yep. Actually, the other day, you know, here's the thing, you know you're a writer or you know you like writing when you even have your emails edited. <laughs> yes. Right. So Dion Lister was on. She's an editor and an author and I needed to write an email to a client and I wasn't happy with how it read and I sent her a message, have you got five minutes? I need to have an email edited. I was like, all right. And she was good. She came out and said, you shouldn't have this, change that. And I sort of sat back when I got that review going, what am I doing? I'm having an email edited just to try and book in a job. <laughs> it means 
do you care? <laughs> yeah, it is. But it was also that sort of slap in the face going, okay, you've gone way too far. Like, <laughs> someone is, it, someone's going to get that email and go, yeah, whatever, we'll book that in for July, you know, whatever it was, you know, September. <sighs> so, yeah. No, I think that is some sage advice. Now, where can people find you out there on the internet? Come on, let's do the whole big Valerie Koo advert now. <laughs> the main place, of course, is the Australian Writers' Centre, and that's at writerscentre.com.au. So, you know, there's a huge website there with lots of... With Lots of different courses, but you know we try and help you navigate it in a very easy fashion so that you get to the spot that you want to go to that's of, of most interest to you. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we have a blog there as well. There's a you know a click through to the blog, and the blog has lots of resources and interviews with people and um, Q and A's. We have an Ask Valerie section every fortnight where people can ask you know questions about the industry, and I'll answer them. Mm -hmm. um, on uh, the podcast, just search for So You Want to Be a Writer on iTunes. Mm -hmm. I have a personal blog at ValerieKoo.com. Um, but they're, they're the main ones. Cool. Well, all of those links will be up on our show notes. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Now, It's been fun. Here's a question for you because these are our segments we've got coming up. Do you use prompts or do you promote the, the use of prompts to get people writing? Uh, some people don't need prompts, mm. but if you need to get your creative juices flowing, if you're kind of a bit stuck, I do think that prompts can be useful. I, I, I think prompts can be useful in writing exercises if you're just starting and you want to get into that habit of those three pages a day mm. and you just don't know what to write about, <laughs> then prompts can be useful then, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I personally don't use them, but I, I, I think they're useful when you want to get some momentum going. All right. Well, Catherine, we do a prompt every week for those that do like to use them. Catherine sent this one through. And it's unintentional art. What do you pass by every day that is not an eyesore or not something to ignore but art? What can you look at tomorrow that is art and not just nothing? Describe the unintentional art in your office or your house. Huh. I love that. I think that's great. Yes, well, because I obviously I run my own business now. We don't have an office other than my house but when I worked for a place that had an office building the owner of the business was a nutcase and <laughs> her idea of decorating the office was to have one bright red wall and then one bright fluoro green wall and then oh, a blue one. I tell you if you didn't have a migraine by the end of the day you were a very angry person. Mm. So yes, mm. unintentional art. Or not art. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Here's a word of the week. We like to do our words of the week. This one is from Arlene Miller's Weird and Wonderful Words, which is at bigwords101.com. Colology. Oh. The study of, which is one of those circular definitions that defines itself by its definition. So the study of study. Oh, my goodness. Colology. There you go. Wow. Okay. Tr try and get that into a sentence. Not going to happen. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right, well, here we go. We're going to do a uh, tortured sentence now. <laughs> Next time, don't put the rain farces on the rocket slab. <laughs> <laughs> tortured sentences. So that, that bumper intro was recorded from that person who complained about the bread selection. <laughs> now... These tortured sentences, and I'm sure that you come across them, you would have loads of them, I bet. Um, Catherine, being a, a, a teacher, professor of English, has her students submit essays, and she picks out the worst sentences, and we read them out to the internet. Oh, no. Right? So here's a lesson. If you're ever in Catherine's class, make sure you read your work, because it'll end up on the show. Um, I'm not sure what the topic was for here, but it says... Both authors' tones was very... Was, God, I can't even read it. See, I don't ever proofread these. Both authors' tones was very was if they really believed what they were trying to convey to you, but if you're an educated reader, you'll quickly know there is a lack of knowledge of the topic and you're not one step close to feeling the way they feel about both topics. Holy wow. crap. And these That's are adults. Beyond, beyond tortured. Oh, Christ. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't even know where to begin with that. That's just horrendous. <laughs> There's a the thing about, and 
probably the best advice that we've ever had on this show. People will say, if you've got something, if if you've written something down, read it out aloud. Yep. Because I just read that out loud, and I, there's no full stops or commas in that either. Mm. Um, if I actually read that without taking a breath, I'd probably pass out. But that's what I. <laughs> um, yeah, that's just terrible. Wow. And these are that's... people that are doing creative writing courses and they're doing oh. like critical thinking courses, that sort of stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> Lack of thinking. Anyway, now, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? Oh well. Uh, my co-host Alison Tate on So You Want to Be a Writer, the podcast. She's great fun. Mm-hmm. Um, her website's alisontate.com and she's uh, she she's got a great blog there because she talks about her writing journey and um, you know all the various things that that people ask her because she tries and answers them as well. Mm-hmm. And her book's about to come out uh, in October. Wow, well, we'll have to have her on the show because that was the initial thing. I was hoping to have both of you on mm. to talk about the podcast, but. You know, like everything, Saturday morning for us Aussies can be a pain in the ass. Yeah, right. school sport, everything, I know. So, yeah, we might have to try and work out a time. We can either have her on or both of you on maybe, you know, midweek or something. Or It'll be Sunday. fun. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being on. Um, I've got a shout-out for Kristen, I think that's how you pronounce the person's name. Uh, see, I, you know, I slammed the person for giving me a review last week. This is a more positive one. Um <laughs> It's in regards to, we're talking about beta readers, people that test books. And I asked, you know, where can people go if you're interested in doing that sort of thing uh, and reading crap books, Uh, (laughs) crap versions of books. And Kristen said, look, I found your podcast today and I love it. Thank you. Going back to listen to more, just don't listen to the first 15. Terrible. I was listening to one and you were talking about beta readers or beta readers if you're American. Mm-hmm. I recently got into beta reading. I found a group on Goodreads where writers and beta readers can connect. So check out uh, Goodreads. Um, mm-hmm. Now, really quickly, I'd like to sort of talk about, and we're sponsored by audible.com, which is such a great place, especially if you like your audio books. Um, please check out audibletrial.com slash newbiewriters. You get a free audio book. You know, can't complain with that. Valerie, you should have your book up on Audible so I could play a little bit. I believe it is. Is it? Oh, let's have a look. Hang on. (laughs) I think it is. You think it is? Someone bought the audio book rights. (laughs) It is. Narrated by Lucy Price Lewis. Hang on, let's play a little bit, shall we? Let's see if it's on. And power of storytelling into our lives. It's vital to bring it back into the way we do business. Storytelling is intrinsic to the human experience because we're hardwired to Oh, she's got a cute voice. I'm going to have to listen to that. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> Maybe you should. Um, yeah, that sounds cool. And it's got, yeah, nearly four-star rating. Cool. So check out audibletrial.com slash newbiewriters and type in Power Stories by Valerie Koo. It's up there. And you can get it for free if you sign up for the trial. So there you go. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, all right. So I think that'll do it for this week. Our quote of the week is, do what you love and the money will follow. And that's by our guest today, Valerie. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why, wise words. You know, We're not going to pinch anything from Gandhi or whoever. We've got Valerie <laughs> on. She can do our quote of the week from now on. <laughs> All right. So until next week, we'll see you then. Your book starts here on the Newbie Writers Podcast.